To the darkness You're the only right among the wrong You're the only hope among the chaos You are the voice that calls me on Louder than every night Our sword in every fight The truth will chase away the night your name is power over darkness Freedom for the captives Mercy for the broken and the hopeless Your name is faithful in the battle Glory in the struggle Mighty will let us down or fail us Your name is power Your name is power written hope is certain I know that the word will never fail I know that in every situation you speak the power to prevail louder than every night our sword in every fight the truth will chase away the night your name is power over darkness Freedom for the captives Mercy for the broken and the hopeless Your name is faithful in the battle Glory in the struggle Mighty won't let us down or fail us Your name is power over darkness Freedom for the captives for the broken and the hopeless Your name is faithful in the battle Glory in the struggle Mighty will let us down or fail us Your name is power over darkness Your name is power in the chaos Your name is power well, hey, everyone. So glad that you've tuned in today. I'm Joe Wilson, one of the pastors at CCC. And if you have a Bible, you're going to want to turn to Revelation chapter 2 today. You know, I was thinking just the other day about how much I love to receive mail. I know that it almost seems like a, a thing of the past, this physical mail thing. But I go to my mailbox every day with the anticipation that maybe some card or personal note is going to be there for me. And sometimes there is. Most of the time, the mail's for my wife, Stephanie, or for my dad, who lives with us. Their mail always looks more personal and more fun than mine. But every now and then, I get a note as well. And that means something because it demonstrates that the person who wrote it actually took some time to make it happen. Because, you know, it takes effort to write a letter. You never write a letter accidentally. Now, personal emails and text messages, they all mean something, too. When somebody writes to you, it just feels good. You get kind of this warm, fuzzy feeling inside because it means that somebody's thinking of you. It builds a relationship to exchange words of encouragement. Friends, never underestimate the power of a well-written letter. So most of the time, I love to see personal mail. But we would probably all agree that sometimes letters aren't so great because it means that somebody could be upset with you. And those letters can be tough to read. Some letters are filled with criticism. And you really don't necessarily want to get those. 
Dwight L. Moody was a famous preacher of yesteryear. And one time he got a letter and he opened it up and it had one word on it. The word was fool. Moody said it was the only time he ever received a letter where the person signed the letter but forgot to include the message. Well, I guess that's one way to look at it. We're in a teaching series here at CCC called Seven Letters to Seven Churches. And it's based out of the New Testament book of Revelation. They're letters from Jesus to seven different churches. Now, how would you like to get a letter from Jesus? On the one hand, it sounds pretty awesome, doesn't it? But as we're coming to find out in this teaching series together, Jesus has a way of telling the absolute truth, which can be hard to hear sometimes, but we need to hear it. In fact, this study of these seven letters from Jesus are leading us to the celebration of CCC turning 16 in early March. And these letters contain truth, the words of Jesus, for anyone who has an ear to hear. This week, we're looking at the fourth letter in the series of letters, the letter to the church at Thyatira. Now, interestingly, Thyatira was not a big, important city. The last few weeks, we've looked at Jesus writing letters to big, important cities in the Roman Empire, capital cities, the ornate jewels of Rome. But that's not what Thyatira was. It was mostly a trade town. It was a convergence of roads. It actually began as a military outpost, and it was there basically to slow down any army that might be headed to attack the capital city, Pergamum, which we talked about last week. But when Rome conquered the area, they realized that Thyatira was basically indefensible from a military point of view. It sat in a low valley, and its only real value was as a place of trade. It had location, location, location. It was on the main road to at least four other large cities in Asia Minor. So it had become kind of this trade depot and a very blue-collar city. It was the smallest of the cities that Jesus writes to here in Revelation. And I think that's kind of important to note. You know, those first three letters that we studied together went to Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamum. It would be like Jesus dictating three letters, one to New York City, and one to Chicago, and one to Los Angeles, and then saying, now take down this letter to the church at Miami. Not the big one, Miami and Ohio. What? That's such a little place in comparison to the other three. And this is an important reminder that with God, there are no little places. There are no little people. What mattered to Jesus is that there was a church in Thyatira. There were people in Thyatira that needed to know him. And the only way that that was going to happen is if that church stayed healthy. I mean, there were bigger churches in bigger places, but Jesus saw this place. I love that. I love that no one is unimportant to God. No place is too small. And you should never think that he doesn't know you or care about you. He sees you. And friends, that's really what this letter is about. It's about how Jesus sees you for good or for bad. He sees. Now, it's got some touch, tough teaching. So we need to maybe tighten our belts a little bit and let's dig in together. Notice with me how Jesus begins this letter to the church there. Revelation chapter 2, verse 18. To the angel of the church at Thyatira write, These are the words of the Son of God, whose eyes are like blazing fire and whose feet are like burnished bronze. Now, you might remember our pastor David has been teaching us that each of these letters has an opening with a piece of an image of Jesus. And that image is taken from chapter 1 of Revelation. And each image kind of frames up the tone of one of the letters. And this one starts with this ominous image, a penetrating gaze. And that ought to help prepare us for what's to come. Jesus says, here are the words from the Son of God who has eyes like blazing fire, not a flickering flame, not a warm glow, a blazing fire. In other words, I see you, I see everything about you. All the dark places are brought into the light and they're exposed and there is nothing hidden. This is a penetrating gaze. You know, when I was younger, I worked at church camp for a couple of weeks one summer up in Pennsylvania. My friends from college, Phil and Casey Strunk, had asked me to work there with them. And their mother was the camp cook. And we were the camp staff for some high schoolers. And every night at camp, we had what they called Vespers, which is just a fancy way of saying church at nighttime. And the very first night, 
there were some kids acting up during the service and, and they were just kind of being high school kids. But that used to really bother me if people were being disrespectful to a speaker. And so I just kind of stared at them. They were sort of down my row a little bit and I stared until it got uncomfortable. And then I kept staring and they straightened up and looked afraid. After the service, my friends introduced me to their mom. They said, hey, this is our friend, Joe. He's going to work with us this week. And their mom looked at me and she said, I saw the look you gave those kids tonight. You look mean. I'm going to call you meanie. And she did. For 25 plus years, anytime we sent a greeting to each other, I would say to my friends, hey, tell your mom that meanie says hi. Or if she saw me anywhere, she'd say, look, it's old meanie. So that's who I am, mean Joe Wilson. Well, it's important to know here that Jesus isn't mean, but he isn't a pushover. Here, Jesus looks at the church with a gaze of a flaming fire. I see you. I see everything about you. And it says that he has feet like burnished bronze. He stands with firmness. He's immovable in his truth. Now, some of what he sees is good. And so he starts the letter with a commendation. Notice verse 19. I know your deeds, your love and faith, your service and perseverance, and that you are now doing more than you did at first. I love that. He says, I know your deeds, your love and your faith. I mean, those are a couple of biggies, right? Love and faith. He says, you believe in me. You have faith. You're trusting in me for your eternity and for all of your days here and now. And you love people well. You're welcoming. You care for hurting people. You're going the extra mile. I can see this, Jesus says. He mentions their service and their perseverance. They're not growing weary as a church. They're faithfully holding on to the promises of Jesus and they're encouraging others to do the same. Now, this church in Thyatira, they weren't in a hotbed of persecution like some of the other churches we've studied, but they did live in the same cultural climate and they were being faithful. And he even makes this concession. You're doing more now than you did at first. In other words, you're becoming more generous. Your deeds of kindness are growing. Jesus says, I can see this and I commend you for it. You know what, friends? This is really how it's supposed to be. This is what's supposed to happen as we follow Jesus. The more we know him, the more we see his character, and the more we reflect his character to everyone around us. We are to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus. And I want to say to some of you, I can see you. I see how many of you are taking responsibility for your spiritual journey. You're taking steps of faith. You're loving and serving in specific ways because of what Jesus has done in your heart. You're involved in the community life of the church, spurring others on around you to faith and goodness. And I commend you. And that was happening in Thyatira. And if we could just end the letter there, it would be great. Jesus says, hey, you're growing in faith and love. Awesome. You're in the exact path in those areas that you're supposed to be on. Way to go. But you got a couple of major holes in the submarine. And if you don't do something about those, that ship's going down. Some correction is coming. Notice verse 20. Nevertheless, I have this against you, that you tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrificed to idols. Now, what in the world is he talking about here? Well, if you've been journeying through this teaching series, you've probably already picked up that Jesus uses some metaphorical language in these letters that the first century readers would have immediately understood. And the metaphor here has to do with a woman named Jezebel. And Jezebel is a prominent character in Israel's history. Anyone in that day with a knowledge of history would have known who she was. She was, and still is to some degree, infamous. Jezebel was the queen of Israel about 900 years prior to this letter being written. She was the queen of Israel, but the interesting thing is, she wasn't Jewish. The king, a man named Ahab, had made a political alliance with the Phoenician king and married his daughter to seal the deal, Jezebel. And she brought with her to Israel a fanatical pursuit of her worship of false gods. And she came to Israel with an agenda to influence the king of Israel and to get him to ditch the one true God and instead worship her Phoenician gods. And she was evil. She had prophets and priests of the God of Israel put to death, hundreds of them. And she was absolutely ruthless. 
She brought 850 false prophets and priests and priestesses of her religion to come and live in the palace. And Ahab, the king, was so weak, he just let her work go uncontested. She influenced him to murder people and to accept false testimony and just do the worst things. He was her puppet. Now, the Phoenician gods that she brought with her, they were fertility gods. And so, as you might imagine, the worship of those fertility gods included very lewd dancing. It included sexual sin. I mean, to Jezebel, the worship of the God of Israel must have seemed incredibly boring. So she brought Ahab into the worship of her false gods, and she influenced most of Israel to join her. And almost no one opposed her, except a guy you may have heard of named Elijah. And even he was filled with some fear to stand up against Jezebel. So what you need to know about Jezebel is that she was an influencer of people who got so many people to move away from the one true God. So when Jesus writes to Thyatira, he says, you have a Jezebel in your midst and you're not doing anything about it. You've got someone who's leading people away from God. Notice his words. I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. And what Jesus has against them is that they won't stand up for truth. They don't have any boldness when it comes to standing against false teaching. They're great at loving people, not so great at reprimanding a false teacher. Now, I know that this is going to cut against the grain of our culture, but you know, there are just some things that should not be tolerated in the church and in our lives. There are some things that Christians need to say, no, we can't go there. Uh, among those who are walking the journey with God, there are things that we need to root out of our lives with, with a sense of real ruthlessness because when we get sloppy with what is true and with what's not true, it really leads to a lot of dead-end living. Now, this is true in our spiritual lives, but I want you to see that it can be guilty of this sin of Thyatira in all kinds of areas of, of our lives. At the core, the sin of Thyatira is a combination of apathy and fear which leads to inaction. You know, we're a culture that's rich in bravado, but we are bereft of boldness. We completely are averse to conflict on a personal level. So we put up with all kinds of things and we stay silent about issues of godliness that ought to matter to us. We tolerate things that we shouldn't tolerate. We stick our heads in the sand and hope that the uncomfortable things in our lives will just go away. You know, businesses do this all the time. They have critical issues that they refuse to face and they hope that those things will just go away. Families do this. And instead of handling things head on, dysfunctions go on and on, unaddressed because of our fear of facing it. This happens with our finances. We think, well, maybe if we just ignore our financial issues, maybe they'll just get better on their own. It happens in our relationships. Our fear of conflict and rejection keep us from talking about awkward things that need to be talked about. Individually, people can live with their head in the sand about all kinds of stuff. We get so afraid of bringing the truth to light. But of all the places where this can happen, the one place with eternal consequences is the church. He says, you're tolerating something you can't tolerate because my church is about truth and you're condoning falsehood and this just can't be. You know, it's so important that we get this. You know, at CCC, we're all about being a place where people can find their way back to God. But what if we don't tell the truth about who God is? How could people really know him? What if we gave a picture of God to people that wasn't accurate? Well, then people wouldn't be finding their way back to God at all. We'd actually be misleading people. If we promote a picture of God who's just permissive about everything, that's not an accurate picture. That's a picture of a doting grandparent that never disciplines a grandchild. Folks, we serve a God who is holy and who is truth. And so anything that reeks of falsehood is detestable to him. And when it creeps into the church, we have to address it clearly. And you see, they weren't doing that. There's this prominent woman in the church at Thyatira who claimed to be a prophet. And here's what Jesus says about her. I have this against you. You tolerate that woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophet. By her teaching, she misleads my servants into sexual immorality and the eating of food sacrifice to idols. I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. Now, what exactly was she teaching? We're not 100% sure. 
Historically speaking, it seems that Thyatira was a very blue-collar place, a lot of trades craft happening there. So, you know, if you lived in Thyatira, you might be a metal worker or a garment supplier, or maybe you were a leather worker, just to name a few things. But they had in Thyatira these things called guilds to which you needed to belong, like a trade union, but with a religious bent. Each trade guild had their own god or goddess that they felt was sort of the patron god or goddess to their trade. And so at the guild meetings, there would be sacrifices to their gods and goddesses, and then a meal eating what had been sacrificed. And in some of these guilds, there was even kind of this sexual piece to those gatherings. And here's the thing. If you didn't belong to a guild, you couldn't practice your trade. But if you joined the guild, you were expected to participate in those sinful gatherings. And so it seems that this woman in the church here is doing exactly what Jezebel did with Ahab in the Old Testament. She was saying, this is okay. God knows your heart. He doesn't expect you to give up your livelihood. Join the guild. Participate in the revelry. You can still be a Christian. It just doesn't matter. So in this way, she was misleading people from the church into participating in idol worship, eating sacrificed food, participating in sexual misconduct. And Jesus says, I've given her time to repent and she hasn't done it. And you are tolerating this teaching and it shouldn't be. She was teaching them, your conduct in the guild doesn't matter. You know, your assumptions about things matter in this life. Now, what this woman was teaching was really the result of a whole line of thinking that was taking place back in those days. It was a philosophy of sorts that was all about finding the truth deep inside of you. Now, this is a little bit of an oversimplification, but there were some teachers in those days who suggested that you could have a, a so-called special knowledge, that you could develop a special spiritual knowledge apart from any orthodox teaching or through the way that God's chosen to reveal himself. And they also acknowledge the division between flesh and spirit. So according to these teachers, the spirit could be holy and the flesh could be tainted and that wouldn't affect the holiness. In other words, you could sin with your body and it didn't matter because the flesh is evil anyhow. What matters is your spirit and the special knowledge that you have. And folks, that's just not what's in the Bible. And so she's teaching these people that the flesh doesn't matter, only the spirit, go and sin with the guild, and you can still be a Christian in good standing. And nobody is standing up to this teaching. But Jesus makes it clear, consequences are going to take place. I'm reminded of what the Bible says in the book of Galatians. Do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Whoever sows to please the flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. Whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Friends, know this. God will not be mocked. He is patient. He is long-suffering. The Bible says he's gracious and compassionate, slow to anger, abounding in love. But he will not be mocked. And if you go on and on and on and on in your sin, eventually there are consequences. Now, God had been patient with the church at Thyatira. He had given them time to work up the courage to confront a false teacher, and they hadn't done it. And he had given time for this woman, this one that's like Jezebel, to repent, and she didn't do it. She keeps leading people astray. So notice verse 21. I've given her time to repent of her immorality, but she's unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering, and I will make those who commit adultery with her to suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways. I will strike her children dead. Then all the churches will know that I am he who searches the hearts and minds, and I will repay each of you according to your deeds. This is Jesus with eyes of blazing fire. Now, I want you to see something here. The get out of jail free card is always on the table, and it's called repentance. These consequences that Jesus talks about here, they could be avoided with repentance. Now, repentance is a churchy sounding word that's all about change, a change in your ways, a change in your thinking, a change in your actions, a change in your allegiances, a change to put Jesus and his ways at the center of your life. But it doesn't look like that's going to happen here in Thyatira, at least not on their current course. Maybe this warning is going to make a difference for them, but the outcome is dire 
because Jesus says, I'll cast her on a bed of suffering. I'll make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely unless they repent of her ways and I will strike her children dead. Wow. I mean, that just sounds so harsh, right? It doesn't make sense with some of the other things that we know about God. Well, I want you to remember something. This book has a ton of allegory. And when he speaks about her children, I don't think he's talking about an eight-year-old and a preschooler. That doesn't seem to jive with what we know about God. I think he's talking about those who are following in her footsteps, those who are regurgitating her false teaching, her children in falsehood. But the consequence is straightforward. God says, you know, she's been promoting the activities done on a bed. Okay, I'm going to confine her to a bed and it won't be for pleasure. And those who followed her and joined in the adultery, I will punish them with her and some won't survive it. And the church will know that I am God. I bet they would. You know, there aren't a lot of places in the Bible where God speaks so harshly, but one of those places is in the book of Hebrews in the 10th chapter. Look at this with me. If we deliberately keep on sinning after we've received the knowledge of the truth, no sacrifice for sins is left, but only a fearful expectation of judgment and of raging fire that will consume the enemies of God. Let's talk, pause here and take a breath because that's a little tough to read. But this is one of those occasions to look at the severe wording of the Bible towards those who go sideways with the truth and who get squishy with their beliefs because it ultimately leads to dead ends. And that triggers God's most vehement response because we ought to know better. But I want you to know that that kind of judgment that's not the end result that God desires. He desires our humility. He desires our repentance. He longs to be in rich fellowship with us where there's nothing hidden. He wants true relationship. These consequences, they're really only for ones who won't relent, who will lead others astray and who won't back down. Jesus says that there will come a day when they will fully face the consequences for their arrogance before God. But I want you to see the fairness of Jesus as he addresses the rest of the church. Verse 24. Now I say to the rest of you in Thyatira, to you who do not hold to her teaching and who have not learned Satan's so-called deep secrets. Notice this is kind of a shot off the bow to the false teaching of the day. I say to the rest of you, I will not impose any other burden on you except to hold on to what you have until I come. Jesus confirms with them, I know that not all of you have gone down this path. I can see that. I acknowledge that some of you have given your best efforts here. Nothing escapes my eyes that penetrate with truth. You know, in a way, this is sort of like the comment section on a really big group project. I wonder if you've been in a group project before, maybe in school or at work. I wonder if you've ever had that experience where, you know, there's just the kind of the one person who's not pulling their weight. Or maybe you've been in a group project where you felt like you were carrying the entire weight of the whole group and nobody else was working. Well, Jesus is commenting on a group project here. And the name of this group project is Being the Church at Thyatira. And Jesus says, some of you guys are doing a great job. Way to go. Keep holding on. You get a good grade. I require nothing more than what you've done. But some of you are tanking this project and you need to get on the team or off the team, but know this, I won't let you shipwreck it. But those of you who've done what's right, you keep holding on. And then Jesus finishes the letter with this promise. To the one who's victorious and does my will to the end, I will give authority over the nations. That one will rule them with an iron scepter and will dash them into little pieces like pottery, just as I have received authority from my father. I will also give that one the morning star, Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. I wonder, have you ever felt victorious over something? Maybe you've been part of a team and you had this great achievement. Maybe you won a title or a contest or, you know, and usually when that happens, you've overcome obstacles and there's this feeling of great accomplishment and survival even. And, and of course, the greater the obstacle, the greater your sense of victory. If you persevere in getting the lid off the mayonnaise jar, you'll have a momentary sense of victory, but that'll fade pretty quick. But if you beat cancer, it's different. If you overcome a task on the job, you'll have a sense of victory to some degree. If you persevere through a tough season of the soul 
or a difficulty in your marriage, your victory is greater and there's greater joy. Jesus says to these people, I see. I see that some of you have lost jobs and lost wages because you wouldn't join, you wouldn't participate in those ungodly guilds. I see that you've abstained from false teaching. I see that you've withstood persecution. You hold on because those who are victorious in this life, those who've been under the scrutiny and attack of others for my sake in this life, you'll no longer be under their authority of those ruthless people in eternity. Instead, you'll be my, by my side and my father's given me all authority, so you hold on. Now friends, the letter to Thyatira is the longest of the seven letters in Revelation and it's written to the church in the smallest city. But I think there are several takeaways that we can glean from this if we'll just have ears to listen. The first lesson is that Jesus sees us. Now that thought might be comforting, it might be sobering, or maybe a little of both. But he is the one who has eyes like blazing fire and his gaze penetrates beyond our facade. We can be encouraged because we know that he sees us in our pain. He sees us when we're misunderstood for his sake. No matter what we're going through, he sees us and he encourages us to keep holding on. And he sees us also in our weakness and nothing can be hidden from him. And he calls us to do better. Here's another takeaway. The truth matters to God because he is truth and falsehood undermines all that he stands for. When the truth about who God is or about who Jesus is or uh, uh, about things that flow from the nature and character of Jesus, when these are at stake, we cannot be ambivalent because God cares about the truth. The question is, do we care about the truth? Do we know the truth? Do we know the Bible well enough that when we hear something's false, we can stand up to it? You know, the church in Thyatira just ignored their most divisive problem and they hoped it would go away. And they remained mute when it came to people who were just speaking falsely about Jesus and what's acceptable to a holy God. But truth matters. Obedience to the truth matters. A.W. Tozer said that in the church, we have learned to live with unholiness and we have come to look upon it as the natural and expected thing. And Jesus says, we can't do that. That is just not consistent with following him. One last thought here, and that is, when I'm out of line with the truth, I need to repent. Whether I'm out of line in a big way or a small way, repent just means change, change my thinking, change my allegiance, change my behavior. A lot of times we talk about repentance as this one-time thing, and there's always that first time that we find our way back to God. But you know, then there are these little course corrections along the journey. Now, the beautiful message of the Bible is that nobody's ever too far gone. Even the worst false teacher that Jesus identifies here in the mold of one of the worst historical characters, Jezebel herself, even there, Jesus called for and hoped for repentance. This is the nature of God. He is long suffering, desiring even the hardest of heart to be broken and humble before him. The Bible says, the Lord is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. And maybe that's what you need to hear today, that it doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been or how big of a mess things are for you right now. It's never too late to humble your heart before God, to repent, to change your direction, to change who's in charge. It used to be being, now it's Jesus. Change your allegiance. I encourage you today to do whatever it takes to take a step toward him. For anyone who has an ear, Let him hear. Let's pray about this. Our Father in heaven, we look to you for strength. We look to you as the one who sees us completely and yet still loves us. The one who knows us inside and out and yet has given everything for us. We are so grateful to you. God, we pray that we would recognize that level of relationship with you. And we pray, God, for boldness today, that if there are things that we've just kind of let slide in our lives, that we would boldly kind of stand for truth and your ways no matter what. And God, in those areas where we've wandered, 
where we haven't gotten it right, where we've listened to wrong voices, give us courage to make a change, to come to you with a humble heart, to repent, and to move in a direction that walks alongside you. Give us a dose of courage and boldness today to be faithful. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. We can have such an unwavering trust in God because He loves us so completely. His immense and exceptional love for us was demonstrated through what Jesus did for us on the cross. It's because of Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection that we are forgiven and made right with God. Nothing that we've earned, but a gift that God gave to mankind through the sacrifice of Jesus. That's why we take some bread to reflect on Jesus offering his body for us. We have some juice and remember that his blood was shed for each and every one of us. You're invited to grab some bread and juice and spend some time remembering what Jesus has done for us and how much God loves you.
again, everyone, for tuning in. If you'd like to support CC's efforts to help people find their way back to God and give financially, you can text CCC White Marsh to the number on the screen or just head to communitycc.net and click the gift tab. Your continued generosity and support make all of CCC ministry efforts possible, including the CCC's programming for kids. And one of the things I love about CCC is how much this church invests in the next generation and how the kid teams create off the chart environments for our kids. So if you have kids, you should totally check it out. But be warned, once they get a taste of C3 kids, they'll probably be dragging you out of the bed every Sunday to come back. In just a few weeks, CCC turns 16 years old. And as we head into our anniversary birthday, that's what you call it when your church gets another year older, because we're not really sure if it's a birthday or an anniversary, so we just made up a new word. But on our 16th year anniversary, there's going to be a baptism celebration. If you've been thinking about taking the step of baptism, which is a really big deal in our journey towards Jesus, you can sign up or get more information at CCC's website, communitycc.net. There are some resources there about baptism and why it's such a big deal. You could ask whatever questions you have, so make sure you check that out. I hope this online service was exactly what you needed today, and I hope it was the absolute highlight of your week. See you next time, everybody.